Hello, my name is Ann Smith and this is Perspectives. My guest today is Glenn Nurbach, a dear friend and teacher at Portland High School and director of the Portland Mentoring Alliance. Uh, before I start asking Glenn questions, I thought I'd give you an overview of his career highlights. Uh, Glenn was a middle school social studies teacher here in Portland for 13 years. And then uh, he was asked to join the Maine Department of Education for a um, three year, uh, I guess you'd call it a sabbatical. Then the deal was they would pay for his, uh, uh, they would pay his salary, but he would keep his uh, tenure position, his connection to Portland school systems. And he became a distinguished educator for civic education and service learning from 2006 to 2009. Uh, he was also somewhat overlapping during that time, the president of the Maine Council of Social Studies uh, from 2008 to 2014. Uh, he has been, since he returned to the public school system, the director of Portland Mentoring Alliance for eight years. Uh, his career uh, as a social studies that, uh, teacher and as a leader in the social studies curriculum has reinforced what I think are some of his most outstanding qualities, which is a mind that is uh, incredibly open to the diversity of human nature. Uh, and yet, Glenn, you were born in, in a blue collar neighborhood in New Jersey. And on one occasion, I asked you what the biggest influence was in your childhood towards the, what I see as your strong character as a person who accepts everybody with an open mind. And you said it was uh, a little bit unusual. It wasn't so much that the person taught you as gave you a different kind of example. Would you? Begin by sharing that with us. Sure, and thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. Um, yeah, I grew up in uh, Bayonne, New Jersey, and it was a blue-collar town. It had the dubious distinction for a number of years of having the most bars and liquor stores per capita in the United States, and my father owned one of those taverns. And at the time, uh, the show All in the Family was very popular, and um, my father, growing up in a different age, I think identified more with the character of Archie Bunker, laughing with him rather than at him. And I think probably I was more the Rob Reiner character, Mike Stivic, in it, in terms of uh, my um, openness towards uh, people who are different, different color, different cultures, and so forth. And so it made for a little bit of an uneasy uh, upbringing with regard to different values. I think my father knows better now that he's passed on. but. Um, but it opened my mind into why uh, we, I believe we are all the same deep down. We have the same hopes and dreams and aspirations and fears and concerns. And then I went to a public university, Rutgers University, and I, and I, I have some friends of mine were uh, African-American basketball buddies. And I got to see, once I got to know them one-on-one, -on -one, that there really no, were no differences, that we really shared a lot of the same interests and um, hopes and everything. So. That influenced my, um, those, those two factors influenced a lot of um, my values, I'd have to say. So in other words, uh, you didn't grow up in, a, in an inner city with a wildly diverse culture like many of the citizens of Portland are now. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, you, you grew up pretty much in a white community. And then it was your, uh, your attitude and then what, the people you met at Rutgers that opened your mind even further. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've won quite a few awards as a social studies teacher, and you and I, as both being teachers, um, have talked a lot about curriculum. Uh, when you taught uh, social studies at the middle school level here in Portland, you acquired a reputation for creating very meaningful classroom units. Uh, you told me you prefer the long ones because that's where there's more depth. Um, f would you start by telling us a little bit about uh, the philosophy of education that influenced you? I know you told me it wasn't your own philosophy, but uh, I'd like to hear more about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I've been told, or I've heard anyway, that the new three R's of education aren't reading, writing, arithmetic, but they're relationships, relevance, and rigor. And when I was teaching middle school, I employed that philosophy in my classroom. And the way that it pertained to me and to my students was that I believe that by establishing positive relationships with students, taking an interest in what they're interested in, 
and really caring about them, that they would come to trust that what I had to teach them had relevance to their lives. And I would always try to connect, as a social studies teacher, what I was teaching to something that was going on in the world and, and, and in their world. And once they saw the relevance, I found that I was able to crank up the rigor. And the kids would always overachieve because they knew that I cared about them and they knew that it had relevance to their lives. And they would always exceed expectations with the units that I would um, put together and, and teach them. And they got, I think they got a lot out of it. I, I see that still continuing in your relationships with students in the Portland Mentoring Alliance. Um, I, I work with you with us with another group, which we'll talk about later. But I, I have often come to you in great uh, angst and frustration, <laughs> saying, you know, I'm really getting tired of this particular student, and and you always find a way for me to see it in a positive manner, and 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 build on that relationship so that it won't deteriorate. Uh, and I appreciate that. I, I wanted you to know that. Thank you. Um, I I know you also told me that. Um, like I said, you like to do long units. You did a f unit called Immigration and Citizenship. Uh, would you share that with us? Yeah, I, there were several units that I really enjoyed teaching uh, because, of, because of their relevance. And one in particular had to do with immigration and citizenship. And it was an integrated unit, so all the teachers in our house uh, took part. And my part of it involved helping the students understand the history of immigration to this country. And after we learned about the history, I engaged them in a, an authentic simulation where they took on the persona, each of them took on the persona of an actual immigrant, knowing their biography, and they were asked to come to school that day dressed as that immigrant and go through uh, processing stations which were staffed by other students who were trained to be processors, uh, adopting the mentality of the time, which wasn't being entirely fair to everybody from every country. Like Ellis Island. Like Ellis Island. It was, it was actually called an Ellis Island simulation, and these were actual true immigrants who came through there. So there might be a, a businessman, there might be a mother with three children who's pregnant with her fourth child, and so the girl would come in with a pillow under her dress. and. And they had to go through in, in character each of the stations. And I was there with a video camera making believe I was coming from the future to try to bring back a docu documentary of their uh, experiences. And the kids really loved it. And uh, they were some of them expressed fear that they would get deported because each of the processors had a stamp that stamped their paperwork as either being accepted or not. And, um, and it was really authentic. And later in reflection pieces, the kids wrote how much they got out of that and enjoyed it. And that led up to the actual, uh, com the, the most authentic piece of the unit it had to do with a naturalization ceremony that the kids got to plan. We wrote a grant and got money for that. And so the students um, decorated the school, got to know the countries where the immigrants came from who were being naturalized in our gym, in the school gym. And they, um, they, they were assigned particular um, families when they came to the school to talk to them and talk about their native country and they served them coffee and tea and pastries that morning before the ceremony actually started and then they were the people who were becoming citizens were, were impressed that they got to know that they knew that these students knew about their backgrounds in their country and their culture and then they escorted them into the gym and sat there as the citizens the new immigrants became citizens um, and before the uh, ceremony, we processed with the students what the Oath of Allegiance actually meant, breaking it down into language that they could understand. And while the um, new um, immigrants, when the immigrants became citizens, after they raised their hand and took the Oath of Allegiance, I would look at my students and a number of them would be crying. And later, after the ceremony, I asked, why were you crying? And they, I, they said, now we know what it truly means to be an American, you know? And, and so the, to me, that's the deepest learning that can take place is when it touches not just the head, but the heart. And, um, and the students, I think, really got a lot out of that. And they also um, gave the immigrants, the new citizens, gifts and um, in the receiving line afterwards. So it was a, a very meaningful unit for everyone involved. And we did it three times when I was there. And, and I'm happy to say that the person who took my place when I left the middle school continues with that unit even to this day, so I feel like I've, I've left a little piece of myself behind. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did want to ask you briefly, when you took your uh, sabbatical for three years and worked with the uh, 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 
distinct, when you were a distinguished educator for civic education and service learning, uh, kind of what that involved, with, without going into too much detail, because that's a whole different aspect of teaching. Mm -hmm. But what, what did you do then? Well, I was asked to um, promote civic education and service learning to teachers throughout the state where there was receptivity for that. It, it came at a time when the new main learning results were uh, just being published. And, and I got to um, work with them, uh, work with teachers. I also established a social studies professional development network at the Department of Education, which uh, several of whose members are now part of the main council for the social studies. And so it was a, a meaningful time to do that. And I also was able to put on some conferences while I was at the Department of Ed for professional development for social studies educators, something that the main council continues to do uh, to this day. I'm sure those programs were wonderful, um, especially the idea of sharing with other educators. I, I found that, that when we started to do that over in New Hampshire where I taught, that made a big difference mm -hmm. in, in many schools and, and made for a, a lot of uh, good ideas that I hadn't had before. Mm -hmm. um, then you came back to Portland High School and uh, as the director of the Portland Mentoring Alliance, a program that had already existed for 17 years. Uh, please tell us just a little bit about that program and then we're going to talk about what that program does now. Sure. Well, um, around 1992, a Maine Med executive from Maine Medical Center and uh, the principal of Portland High at the time got together over a cup of coffee, I've been told, and decided it wouldn't it be wonderful to have a program that would match an adult mentor with any student who wanted one. And so they, this program was launched at, as a result of that meeting and initially it was intended for the most at-risk students, those who weren't buying into school. And it didn't go over very well because the kids weren't buying into school so they weren't necessarily buying into the mentoring relationships. Around the same time, uh, Portland became a refugee resettlement community and the population of the school, the demographics changed and the program really resonated with newly arrived immigrant and refugee students who were trying to assimilate into a new culture, learn a new language, uh, get onto a career path or a college track. And so the adult mentors, um, a, a, the, the program is open for any student who would like a mentor, but it especially resonates with the multilingual population in Portland right now and um, 24 years into the program um, each year for the past several years since I've been involved we've matched anywhere between 80 and 100 students a year one-on-one -on -one individually with mentors and it entails three parts. Would you like me to go into this now or did you have another question? Oh uh, no that's go, go ahead that's all right that's because that's to me the that's how I've known you all along okay. is working with this alliance. Yeah. Well, the three parts of the program, the three legs of the stool, as I like to say, are academic support, where a mentor feels confident and comfortable. So if it's a newly arrived student from another country and they're just learning English, it might involve tutoring or reinforcing what they're learning in their English language learner or ELL classes. If it's a student who's been here for a while and they're on a college track and their parents don't know anything about the college process, the mentor could provide great assistance by helping the student with their FAFSA, their financial aid form, with editing their college essay, with looking for scholarship opportunities or taking them on a college visit. These are all really meaningful uh, parts of the program. And then the third part of the program is just socialization, having a trusted friend and role model help a student as they acclimate and assimilate into American culture. Um, so it, each of these parts vary with each of the relationships between a mentor and a mentee. In some cases it might just be heavily weighted towards the academic support, in others it might be more the socialization. But I try to make matches based upon common interests, common second language. So if a mentor speaks French and a student has French as one of their languages, that makes for a solid um, match. I mean, you know, often students express interest in certain careers like law or medicine. I try to find mentors that either are in those fields or have an interest and expertise in those fields to create matches. Um, so the program has been very viable now for almost a quarter century and we're going to be celebrating our 25th anniversary in 2017. Wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I know because I, I know how wonderful the program is because I've seen um, the growth in some of my students that I work with indirectly through you. Um, 
so many of the mentors become uh, seem to become very very involved with these kids they mm -hmm. they care about them and when you're here for the first time uh, you, when you're struggling along with uh, so many unknowns and you don't have anyone in your family who can help you uh, it's wonderful to know that there's someone you can go to particularly the whole process of going on to higher education after mm -hmm. you graduate uh, but also the Mentoring Alliance has become sort of an umbrella for a number of other organizations um, such as uh, the one that I, I'm affiliated with, Bright Future uh, and uh, 4-H. Would you tell us more about uh, their involvement and how that connects to your, your Mentoring Alliance? Well, I'm very grateful that um, volunteers like yourself, Ann, and others, uh, Mitch Mason from the 4-H program and a company of girls, the grand, another grant-funded uh, organization, are involved with, uh, the, with the Portland Mentoring Alliance. And they've become important um, satellite programs to the one-on-one pro the, the -on -one mentoring that I facilitate because it provides enrichment. And the enrichment could involve something like what you do, bringing in guest speakers who provide a perspective on things like uh, students establishing the importance of establishing good credit or bank accounts or volunteer opportunities you know and I'm always impressed with the, the wide range of speakers that you bring in to help students understand more about how to become involved and effective citizens and to really get their feet on the ground in this country and and so the, we've been collaborating now for I think four years. Yep, and it's four years. Four years, and it's been a, a wonderfully rewarding, uh, mutually satisfying, I think, relationship. Uh, with the 4-H program, that's facilitated, as I said, by Mitch Mason, who's the director of the uh, University of Maine Cooperative Extension Youth Education Program, and he involves some of the same students that you work with and others in um, volunteer opportunities, say shopping and cooking for Ronald McDonald House. Uh, he also has coordinated college visits. So in May, for the past three years, we've gone to the University of Maine in Orono for, an, for um, a two-day, an overnight visit where the students attend workshops and they get a feel of what college life is about. Last April, we went to Boston, visited Harvard University and did some fun things there. And, this coming April, uh, Mitch and the students on the leadership committee are coordinating a visit to New York City to visit Columbia University and do wow, some of the things that's there. Great. So it's wonderful to have um, uh, relationships with all these outside organizations because it does provide, as I said, this wonderful enrichment to the program, the one-on-one -on -one mentoring program. And to have um, involved volunteers, conscientious volunteers like yourself and the other people I've mentioned is a real godsend for me and makes my job easier and it provides this, this wealth of um, you know, positive um, vibes and positive uh, reinforcement for what the students are learning in school. And as you said, I mean, uh, uh, teenagers are different from little kids. Little kids usually will connect pretty freely with just about anybody. Mm -hmm. But with this wide number of organizations and individual mentors, you always seem to have, uh, at least uh, for a student at Portland High School who's looking for someone uh, to ask questions of, there's always somebody they're going to find and be able to connect with. Mm -hmm. I've gone uh, to the bowling event. Uh, several times, which is an annual event, sometimes two or three mm -hmm. times. I've gone to that one several times, and uh, I, I can't bowl anymore. <laughs> I was quite chagrined to find out now I have to keep a score, but um, I, I enjoy that every time I go. Mm -hmm. um, Can I just add a little something to that? Oh, sure. Uh, because you mentioned it. I, I'm also very grateful to three corporations that have been involved um, almost since the beginning of the program. I think two have been since the beginning. Um, Maine Medical Center, Unum, and Wex are the three, and they provide some funding that allows me to, to coordinate bowling events um, and uh, other ones like uh, tickets to Merrill Auditorium where perhaps some of these students could not afford to get in but we were able to go to different performances there to provide cultural enrichment and broaden, broadening students horizons so at least once a month I put on a, a different type of uh, activity for mentors and mentees and it's not mandatory it's meant to be something that appeals to to their interests but I think it is rewarding for mentors to get to know one another at these events and also for the students to have some fun and show that it's not meant to be just a, an academic program. It's the, it reinforces the socialization aspect of the program. How, how many um, 
How many youth in your program presently would be combined with a mentor? How many pairs of mentees and mentors do you um, have? I have around um, 80 uh, mentor-mentee pairings right now. Wow. And, and some are focused more on the tutoring, like I said, and others um, take in all three aspects of it. And some of the tutoring relationships eventually develop into full mentoring relationships because the key is establishing trust uh, showing a student that you care and then it's that heart-to-heart -heart connection that really develops into the true fruits of the program and the thing that always touches me is you know I'm, I'm the matchmaker but the real work if you want to call it that or, or joy comes from the building of the relationship and it always touches me at graduation each year when I'm walking around following the graduation and I'm seeing the joy and sometimes some tears in the eyes of the mentors knowing that they were there to help their mentee get to that point perhaps a little more quickly or um, maybe a little with higher grades or maybe get them on a college track um, in a more timely fashion than they would have if they didn't have that extra support in their life. Um, you have a, a little video that we're going to include probably right about at this point in, in our uh, interview which basically has mentors and mentees mm -hmm. talking about the, how much meaningful this experience has been for them. And we're also going to include throughout this uh, program, uh, particularly during the last part, pro, uh, photographs of, of kids connecting to other people. You want your community to be strong. You want the people around you to be self-sufficient and have good self-esteem. So these are all things that I think that the Portland Mentoring Alliance helps. It's a pretty easy process. You do have to fill out a form and you do have have to have a background check. Obviously we you know want to make sure kids are safe. I think we're supposed to spend, I signed a, a contract, supposed to spend about an hour uh, a week together, but we typically spend about an hour and a half, two hours together. We talk about things that are very important, but we can do it on a very casual basis. People come together, they feel more like a family and you learn something from them. I've learned so much about different cultures. And I've learned so much about my own culture through the questions that kids ask. She's definitely like a good friend of mine, not just a mentee at this point. She's a friend, but like family. I think connecting with somebody like that makes me feel that I'm not alone. And that's reassuring. 25 years as of January 2017, which is when this program is airing. Um, do you still need more help? Well, I never turn down a mentor, who want, a volunteer who wants to become a mentor. I'll always find someone for that person to mentor. Right now, I'm in pretty good shape this year anyway for matches. But the interesting thing about Portland is there are always new students coming into the school, in all the schools um, from other countries and transferring internally. And I'm always um, receptive to bringing new students into the program. So if I didn't have somebody to match with immediately, I would keep that mentor's application on file until I found someone that could be matched. And I, it's a rolling application process. I accept applications throughout the year because even though we may be entering, say, the spring semester, um, if a volunteer was interested in being matched with a ninth grader or a 10th grader or even an 11th grader, and wanted to continue beyond the one year, they would have that relationship already established so you could hit the ground running when the, when the subsequent school year begins. So uh, I'll never turn down an application. I'll be happy to meet a prospective mentor anywhere, in coffee shops or at the school, wherever is convenient. And um, I make matches throughout the year, even in May and June. I know four years ago when you and I started working together, um, uh, both my friend Anthony Bazia and I wanted very much to become involved somehow with your program. Uh, and we weren't sure exactly how we wanted to fit in. I know um, Bazia wanted to fit in in the way of uh, sharing what he's learned as a person who is also a refugee, what he's learned during his experience how to become an American. I, I, I don't think I've ever met anybody from another country who was as an enthusiastic American as Bazia, even, even to wearing a red, white, and blue bandana on his head because he loves his country so much. And four years ago, um, you had a sudden influx of, I think they were pretty much central uh, African refugees, a lot of Rwandans, Burundians, uh, many older, many who were, you know, like in their junior or senior year. And uh, so we um, 
you, you invited us basically to start our group. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I will never forget that first year. It was so meaningful to me. I've never learned so much in my whole life in such a short time. Um, the boys that I remember the best named the group Bright Future. Uh, what did you see? What did you see that made that program a success? Because it's still going on now. Well, I, I think it was successful, first of all, because of your, your and Bazia's enthusiasm for it and, uh, and how the connection with Bazia, especially with his enthusiasm for citizenship, influenced the new um, the students from the, the African countries and how it helped them to understand what it truly means to be an American citizen. Um, I also think that the, the time, the care, the consideration that you put in to create interesting activities for them, I, I think to the, back to the three um, students, two from Rwanda, one from Burundi, who you connected with the uh, deputy, sheriff's deputy program at St. Joseph's College, where they spent a week learning how to become um, a, a deputy for their uh, program there and seeing them in their uniforms and how proud they were for that. I mean, I think that instilled a certain sense of confidence and leadership ability in them, and all three of them are doing very well right now in college, even though when they first came here, things were fairly uncertain in their lives. So I think, again, it goes back to the three R's, the relationships, the relevance, especially those two, and then it's up to them to, to find the rigor, but I think that they've all been successful, all the students who've been involved with it, and that's why the program has been viable and continuing into its fourth year. I really enjoyed uh, having you here as my guest today, Glenn. And um, we're going to put up at the very end uh, another announcement again of how they can reach you. Uh, it's also, I know, was in the video that we saw. But I do want people who are interested in this program to call you, to offer their services if they'd like to try being a mentor, even if they could you know, come to an activity mm -hmm. and get to know the kids. Um, thank you very much for being my guest today. Thank you for having me. And uh, we will definitely, uh, I may invite you back for some other interesting discussions. Thank you. You, you know where to find me. Yeah. <laughs>so much for joining us today um, I have enjoyed doing this show for quite some time and I hope you're uh, looking forward to our next program